Hello, I'm Ted Venema. Let's talk about tinnitus. Tinnitus, as we can see, comes from the Latin word tenere, which means to ring like a bell or to tinkle. The maddening thing about tinnitus, ringing in the ear, is that it's almost always subjective. Only the client, him or herself, hears it. It's not a real, actual, objective sound. And yet the person, him or herself, isn't mad either. They're upset, but there's nothing wrong with the person. The main treatment for tinnitus is to get the person to realize it's just a nuisance. It's not dangerous. Let's look at tinnitus a little bit better, or a little more. First of all, there's no magic bullet for tinnitus. Tinnitus comes in all shapes, sizes, and colors. There's all different people reported as roaring, clicking, ringing, noises in the ear, and people tend to notice it most in dead quiet. People who are trying to sleep, or that's when they'll notice the tinnitus. People will notice tinnitus when they're concerned or under stress. It's when they're paying attention to it that we tend to layer it like an oyster does a pearl. It's part of tinnitus is a, the actual perception of a sound, but the bigger part is the reaction formation that we cause around it, making it grow worse and worse in our perceptions. There is really, as I said, no definitive cause for tinnitus. It can be as simple as wax laying against the drum to something as awful as an eighth nerve tumor. Usually, the cause is somewhere in between. It's a lack of balance between afferent, brain-going information from the inner hair cells, and efferent, brain-to-outer hair cell information. The, the, la the lack of the balance between brain-going and brain-sending information. You see, the cochlea is not a two it is a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. Inner hair cells send info to the brain, outers receive info from the brain, and when there's a lack of balance there, the brain actually is waiting for sound it's not getting, and it turns up its gain to hear that sound, and there's the tinnitus. It's a difficult thing, and that's why there's no magic bullet. The main thing for physicians is to rule out an eighth nerve tumor, because one of the symptoms of an eighth nerve tumor is tinnitus. Tinnitus, you can have hearing loss without tinnitus, so there's no surprise if you can have tinnitus without having hearing loss. In fact, some people with super sensitive, ultra, you know, better than normal hearing report tinnitus. So in dead quiet, they'll be, they have overly active hair cells, and again, there's this imbalance. So tinnitus can, can occur with hearing loss, but you don't necessarily have to have hearing loss to have tinnitus. Again, the people who have tinnitus with normal hearing often have supersensitive, hypersensitive hearing. The most common hearing loss associated with tinnitus is noise-induced hearing loss. Usually the tinnitus that comes with noise-induced hearing loss is a high-pitched ringing. Another tinnitus associated with hearing loss is the roaring tinnitus that comes with Meniere's disease. More like a the roaring tinnitus and rotary vertigo that accompanies the episodic bouts of sensory neural hearing loss with the awful thing called Meniere's disease. When I talk to clients with presbycusis who talk about tinnitus, this is what I usually say to them. When you, were, had, when you had normal hearing, the, you could hear background ambient noise. And when you heard ambient background noise, that tended to mask or cover the tinnitus. But now that you don't have normal hearing anymore, you can't hear that ambient noise, and so it no longer covers or masks the tinnitus. You see, tinnitus is a strange thing. It's actually, most people have some sort of tinnitus. Even people with relatively normal hearing, if you go into a soundproof room, totally soundproof, and so that you can even hear your lunch digesting, I mean that quiet, eventually you will hear some kind of a ringing in your ear. Everyone will report it at a different pitch, but the, the thing is, background noise tends to mask or cover the tinnitus. 
There was a researcher way back in the, in the mid-1900s who, who report, his name was Fowler, and he measured the intensity of people's reported tinnitus. Do you know what? The reported tinnitus, when he matched it for loudness, he found that it was actually only about five decibels above their hearing levels. What he did was he put sound into the ear opposite from the tinnitus. If somebody complained about having tinnitus here, he put sound in this ear and he, he said for the person to crank up, ask me to crank up the volume until you think it matches the loudness of the tinnitus in your bad in, in this ear. And the thing is, he, he found that the tinnitus was actually only about five decibels above the person's ability to hear. So let's say if the person had a third, if it took 30 decibels to just barely hear the tone, the intensity of the measured tinnitus was only 35. So he said, ah, it's very soft. You have nothing complain to complain about. Quit your whining. Not a very sympathetic or empathetic approach, but the point is there's a low correlation between the, the, uh, the, 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 the loudness perception of your tinnitus and the amount by which you are annoyed by it. You see, this is the thing about tinnitus. It doesn't have to be very loud or intense for it to drive one nuts. Think about if you're trying to sleep in one bedroom and a person across the hall is snoring and you can hear the snoring. How bad are you going to let it bug you? The snoring may not even be that loud, but if you let it bug you or if you're really perseverating on it, it'll drive you nuts. Same with the dripping of a faucet. It may not be all that loud, but it can drive you crazy, especially when you're powerless to do anything about it. And this is part of the treatment about tinnitus. Teaching a person that, you know what, you notice it more at some times than you do other times. That's the first grip you get of power, mastering tinnitus. Because when you realize that you notice it more in some situations than in other situations, you can manipulate your environment so as to mask the tinnitus more. Generally today, it's a two-pronged approach to tinnitus. Masking with a bit of background noise could be a radio between stations, could be one of those hippy-dippy, newfangled, new age kind of waterfall sounds, whatever. The other point of the, the other prong of treatment is counseling, to explain to the person that, you know what, we've had tests done, audiologic tests, a doctor has ruled out dangerous uh, an eighth nerve tumor. So if the, the fear is taken out of the person's brain, if you can take the chain off their brain, so to speak, then the person can indeed look at the tinnitus as, hey, it's just a nuisance. It's not dangerous. It's not something I have to be weirded out about. It's just essentially kind of a nuisance, and I notice it more at some times than other times, so guess what? I try to cover it with background noise whenever it really bugs me. One other thing I'll finish with right here is hearing aids. You know the old saw about hearing aids. Oh, they pick up all that background noise. Hearing aids pick up background noise. Well, that's a silver lining in the cloud when it comes to tinnitus, because the background noise that hearing aids pick up can sometimes mask the tinnitus one experiences. Anyway, food for thought. Just thought I'd talk about that at the very end. It's been a slice. Thanks for listening. <laughs>